So we're going to fire up the PowerPoint, right? So that's the title of my sermon, but go ahead and uh, go to the next slide while I'm getting used to having blinding lights in my eyes. But I really am delighted to be here. It's been a, a pleasure to serve here in California in the, in the five state western region for all these years. And this gives you just a, a snapshot of the areas of, of our ministry. But today actually is a day for celebration because we had two really important bills in the California legislature this year. And just the other day, Thursday, Governor Newsom signed both of them. Um, now, I don't know if you've ever lost your job because of Sabbath or because of sexual harassment or, or some other reason, but chances are, if that happened to you, you weren't uh, picking up the phone immediately and looking for a lawyer. You were trying to find another job. You were trying to put your life back together. If it was harassment, you might be seeking some counseling. Uh, what you may not have realized is how short a time leash you had to protect your legal rights. Companies, if they have disputes with one another, you know, they've got resources, they've got lawyers, they've got four years on contract claims to, to file their claims in court. Up until the other day, we all as workers had one year. And that was double the time that many Americans have in many states under federal law. Well, we just made that three years we now have adequate time to put our lives back together and then to figure out if we have any legal recourse and, and, and find some help. And it's not always easy to find help, and, and that's frankly why we're here. We've become, over, over the course of these 25 years, really the go-to for religious discrimination, not just for, for Adventists with Sabbath problems, but people of many other faiths as well. And it's, it's been... You know, one of the things that Adventists are known for, as Pastor Mike was saying, is not just, uh, you know, being vegetarian or, or not eating pork or, you know, going to church on Saturday. We're known internationally and nationally for our work for religious freedom. And it has really been a privilege to be part of that part of this ministry. In the past couple, in recent weeks, we had one week where we had seven calls for help in a single week. In the last several months, we filed four new Sabbath cases, all for relatively new members, people who have joined the church within the last uh, three or four years. Uh, and it seems that um, that's where, you know, we're really having the most difficulties. But... Um, it, it really has been a joy. Well, <clears throat> I was told I was on a time leash. I'm not very good with leashes. <laughs> Let's go to the next slide. Let me just have a word of prayer with you as we go to the sermon. Father in heaven, I just really hope and pray that that we would receive wisdom from on high today, and that it wouldn't just be my words, that, that there would be the blessing of your presence in our worship in, in this sermon now. In Christ's name, amen. amen. The disciples of Jesus, they knew that something momentous was about to happen, but they don't know what it is. They're still trying to make sense of, of recent events, the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. All their lives they were taught to expect the coming of the Messiah, the son of David, who would rule all nations with a rod of iron. The crucifixion they didn't expect. So what happens next? Does Jesus take the throne of Israel and cast off the Roman rule? Jesus told them to wait for the promise of the Father. Wait? Why wait? What's going to happen? Lord, is it at this time that you will restore the kingdom to Israel? It's not an academic question. The disciples cherish the thought, not only of Jerusalem becoming the seat of global empire, 
but of their role sitting next to Jesus, next to the Messiah's throne. They want the Messiah of power. Messiah the Prince. Instead, they got the suffering servant of Isaiah, the one who was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, bruised for our iniquities. All we like sheep have gone astray, but with his stripes we are healed. The disciples did not get the Messiah they wanted, but they did get the Messiah they needed. I think the same is true for us today, isn't it? Sometimes we don't get the Messiah that we want, and our prayers aren't always answered the way we wish they would be but we do get the Messiah that we need. Amen? Amen. Lord, is it this time that you are going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus answered, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons the Father has reserved to his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be my witnesses to Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost ends of the earth. And indeed, they, they, they were. Well, the disciples wanted to govern. They wanted to rule. They wanted to make the laws, to set policy, to rule a righteous nation, to establish God's kingdom. But this was reserved to the Father's authority. The Greek word for authority here is exousia. The authority to rule, the exousia, belongs to the Father. It has never been given to the church. Whenever the church has sought political power, it has usurped the authority of the Father. Instead, the church has been given a much greater gift. It's been given the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit. Dunamis, of course, is the Greek word we get words like dynamic and dynamo and dynamite from. The power of the Holy Spirit was given for the church to be a witness for Christ to the entire world. With this gift, 12 humble men changed the course of human history. The power of the Holy Spirit is a strange sort of power because with God, things get turned Upside down, inside out. The first or last, the weak are strong. So it is that Paul writes that the Lord said to him in his struggle with infirmity, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is perfected in weakness. Power perfected in weakness? What a strange sort of power indeed. Well, that's the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit. It's the power of God's grace. The church's most prized possession is the grace of Jesus Christ. We are recipients of grace, and we're not merely to proclaim the power of God's grace to forgive sins, to save, and to heal. We are to live out the power of God's grace in our own lives, our power to influence the world is entirely a function of our exercising the gift of grace, of our willingness to extend grace to others. The dunamis power of the Holy Spirit is the power to forgive the unforgivable, to love the unlovely. If we're to be about our Father's business, we've got to be in the grace business. We can't afford to preach the grace of Christ to forgive the sinner, and then contradict the message of grace by our own attitudes, judging, rejecting, <coughs> criticizing, insulting. Amen? Amen? If we want to witness to the love and to the grace of Christ, may I suggest that we begin by showing grace to one another. How about we call a truce in the worship wars, in the theological wars, the fights that we pick with one another in church. May I remind you that people are dying, 
going to a Christless grave while we bicker. Well, it's been a long time since I've been here in Santa Clarita, so maybe this church is exempt from some of these problems. I, I hope and pray. Maybe this is a place where we do practice grace right here in church, extending grace to one another. In Matthew 28, we find what we call the Great Commission. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. Here's the exousia again. But Jesus doesn't give that authority to his disciples. He gives them authority to teach, to preach, to baptize. So the exousia belongs to the Father, and it belongs to Christ, but it has never been given to the church. Now let's take a look here at Revelation 13, beginning in verse 11. I saw another beast arise out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, spoke as a dragon, and he exercised all the authority of the first beast in his presence. Seventh-day Adventists understand the prophetic symbolism here to reference the United States. Horns are a symbol of power. And in the symbols of Daniel chapters 7 and 8, the medieval church-state union is represented, we believe, by a single little horn. But here the U.S. is symbolized by two horns, representing the separation a distinction, a separation, both a separation of powers and a separation of church and state, of civil and religious authority. Power corrupts. So our founding fathers divided power among the three branches of the federal government, uh, Congress, the executive, the presidency, and the courts, but also power is divided between federal, state, and local governments. Now, Adventists have a common misunderstanding, I think many of us do, that somehow the lamb, uh, symbol of Jesus, meek and mild, our, our wonderful ideals of the lamb, that this represents our past and present, while the dragon is our future. But in the Greek tense, it's an imp uh, imperfect indicative active, which is to say in plain English, this means that both the having two horns like a lamb and speaking like a dragon, these are actions that began in the past, but they're imperfect, they're incomplete. They're active, they're continuing into the present and even into the future. So the picture here is of the great controversy between Christ and Satan, lamb and dragon, throughout American history. Well, it's, it's easy to view American history through this lens. We've got our marvelous ideals of freedom and equality, of a government of, by, and for the people. But even from the beginning, this was an ideal. It wasn't the reality. It certainly was not the reality for women who uh, were unable to choose their government for more than 100 years. And it certainly wasn't the reality for Africans who became unwilling immigrants and were enslaved for hundreds of years. If you want to assess the erosion of American liberty through a prophetic lens, you need to focus not only on the destruction of freedom secured by the Bill of Rights, but also on the erosion of the separation of powers, on the creation of an imperial presidency, and the exercise of nearly unrestrained executive power uh, following, really, Richard Nixon's famous quip that if the president does it, it's legal. Such an analysis would be a wonderful Sabbath afternoon discussion, but it's, it's out of reach for this morning. I will say this uh, you know, imperial presidency has been growing under both Republican and Democratic administrations. It's, it's not unique to one party or the other. So in Revelation 13, we see the tension throughout American history between lamb and dragon. But we also get a glimpse into America's future because the verse says that under the influence of the dragon, America will exercise all the authority of the first 
feast in its presence. Here's that word exousia again. The very authority denied to the disciples of Jesus, denied to the church, now is exercised in our future. Well, in a few words, Revelation 13 depicts a Christian America that has modeled itself after the Holy Roman Empire, a nation where church and state collaborate to impose and enforce an idolatrous, nationalistic, patriotic worship as a matter of law. We know the religion is Christian in name and in form because Jesus warned us about Christian deceptions in the last days. We know it is nationalistic and patriotic because it is the worship of a beast. And in prophecy, a beast represents a nation. We know it is worship enforced by law because the dragon speaks and causes these things, and a nation speaks through its laws. We also know it is worship enforced by law because the nation exercises all the authority of the first beast. During the Middle Ages, the church did not govern directly, but exercised authority over kings, influencing laws, domestic and foreign policy, and even called for military ventures known as the Crusades. Revelation 13 is also where we find the apocalyptic symbol of the mark of the beast. 666. The Bible says all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, are compelled to worship the beast and to receive his mark in the forehead or in the hand or else. The symbolism of the mark in the forehead or in the hand is much more significant than many realize. It is a counterfeit of what God commands his people to do in the Torah, in the books of Moses. The first place we see it is in Exodus 13. We see it again in Deuteronomy. This is a picture of a Jewish man wearing the phylacteries. The phylacteries are little boxes that uh, Jews were of ancient, uh, back in the Torah, were commanded to place God's teachings in and put them on the forehead and the hands. Do you see why the mark of the beast is a counterfeit of this? And three times in Exodus and again in Deuteronomy, they're commanded. Next slide, please. So in Exodus 13, <clears throat> the command is to remember the Passover to put the story of the Passover in the phylacteries and, and to bind those on the forehead and in the hand. Well, the Passover is the story of redemption. It's deliverance from slavery in Egypt to freedom in the promised land. The Passover lamb is a type of, of Messiah Jesus, the lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. And so we see the mark of the beast as a counterfeit of the plan of salvation itself, a counterfeit of the gospel, a counterfeit of the grace of God in supplying the Lamb. And then in Deuteronomy 6, the command is repeated. This is a passage that is recited in the synagogue every, virtually every service. Shema, oh, Shema, hear, O Israel, Shema, O Israel, Sh I've got, I've got a brain freeze here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and might. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children. When you walk by the way, when you rise up, and when you lie down, you shall bind them as a sign upon the doorposts of your house, and on your foreheads, and on your hands, right? So what are the phylacteries? It's a symbol of our belonging to God. He is our God, and we are his people. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. I just had to do that. I'm, 
<laughs> I'm so embarrassed now. I can't believe I... Anyway, <clears throat> moving right along. The phylacteries are all about our relationship to God, our belonging to God. He belongs to us. We love him with all our heart, soul, and might for all that he's done for us. Amen? Amen. While we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. But the mark of the beast, well, if you're putting you know, the mark in your forehead and your hand, then what's the counterfeit? The counterfeit is now we belong to the beast. We don't belong to Jesus. We belong to a, a false Jesus. We give our loyalty to another God. But this other God is worshipped in Jesus' name. It's a counterfeit of Christ, a replacement for Christ. Biblical term for that is an anti Christ, which doesn't necessarily mean, uh, you know, dark, evil, opposed to Christ. It means in the place of Christ. Christ in name, but not in character. And Jesus warned us about this in his apocalyptic sermon given in Matthew 24 from the Mount of Olives as he surveyed the beautiful temple that he knew would be destroyed. And Jesus said, take heed lest no man deceive you. For many will come in my name and deceive many, right? Now the deception that Christians need to pay attention to, they're not the excesses of the left. They're not the threat of a militant Islam or a militant atheism. It's the threat of a militant Christianity. It's the deception of a church triumphant that desires to rule all nations with a rod of iron in the place of Christ. Now this is not to say that the left uh, has not become a threat to the church. Uh, it certainly has in some respects. Here in California, we have literally been fighting for the survival of our institutions like uh, Pacific Union College against legislative efforts that threaten our institutions. So we know that the excesses of the left do pose genuine threats to the church. The left has its own heresy of religious liberty. The heresy on the left is that religious liberty is just what we do here in church, but as soon as we step outside the church, we have to play by their rules, and we're not allowed to uh, operate according to our own beliefs and our own values. It's just like Satan to use a militant, secular, or atheistic left to arouse the church to react, to rise up and seek power. So it is that the triumphant earthly power before the return of Christ, it's not militant atheism or militant Islam. It's the king of the north. Modern day Babylon. Slide, please. The harlot church riding on the beast. The symbolism says it all. The church is on top holding the reins of power while the beast is a symbol of the state. Now, in Revelation 12, there's a, a woman clothed in white representing a pure church, devoted to Christ. But here, the harlot, the woman dressed in scarlet, has exchanged the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God's grace, for the exousia, the authority of the world. Next slide, please. Ellen White describes what the church has done whenever she has lost the grace of Christ. Finding herself destitute of the power of love, she has reached out for the strong arm of the state to enforce her dogmas and execute her decrees. Here is the secret of all religious laws that have ever been enacted and the secret of all persecution from the days of Abel to our own time. Christ does not drive, but draws men unto him. The only compulsion he employs is the constraint of love. When the church begins to seek for the support of secular power, it is evident she is devoid of the power of Christ, the constraint of divine love. 
Next slide, please. Notice she says when the church begins to seek for the support of the secular power, it's evident she's devoid of the power of Christ. The power of Christ is the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit. So what Ellen White is saying, without using the biblical Greek, is that when the church covets the exousia, the power to rule, she forfeits the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit, the power of grace. So has the church in America begun to seek the support of the secular power? Well, I think here we need a little history lesson. I'm going to start with the latter part of the 19th century, when the American public school movement took off, and public schools were thoroughly Protestant. Teachers read from the King James Bible, they led the class in prayer, and as Roman Catholic uh, immigration increased, Catholics felt increasingly alienated from public schools and protested. In various cities, the conflict over religion in the schools led to violence and, and protests, riots in the streets of cities like Philadelphia. Catholics felt excluded from public schools because of their Protestant character. So they founded their own parochial school system and began to seek for public funding, arguing that it was unfair only to fund the Protestant-oriented so-called public schools. Protestants, on their part, opposed the Catholic drive for parochiate. And in 1947, established an organization called Protestants, initially called Protestants and other Americans united for the separation of church and state. Now, instrumental in the founding of what is now known as Americans United were Seventh-day Adventist religious liberty leaders, working together with Baptists, Methodists, and many others. When the Supreme Court held in Brown v. Board of Education in 1954 that racial segregation in public schools was unconstitutional, Protestants began to create their own segregated Christian schools, literally by the thousands. The Christian school movement was also given impetus by Supreme Court decisions in the early 1960s ruling that the separation of church and state required public school teachers and officials to refrain from school-sponsored prayer and devotional Bible readings. It's never been true, friends, that the Supreme Court kicked God out of public schools. Uh, they don't have that much uh, hubris to think they have the right to tell God where to go. And as for kicking prayer out of public schools, well, you know the old saying is, as long as they're math tests, there will be prayer in public schools, right? <laughs> so, <clears throat> even with the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964, outlawing discrimination, it was perfectly legal for Christian schools to be segregated. I didn't realize that until I looked into this. The Civil Rights Act had a limited reach to public accommodation, things like transportation, hotels, restaurants. It was when states began to get into the civil rights business that they extended non-discrimination laws to all businesses. Hence, Colorado's effort to hold Christian baker Jack Phillips liable for refusing to bake a wedding cake uh, for a same-sex couple, a case I'm sure you've all heard about. Well, throughout the 1960s and 70s, Protestants were generally happy to stay out of politics as long as the government left them alone. Even the Supreme Court decision of Roe v. Wade legalizing abortion did not trouble Protestant leaders, many of whom welcomed the decision at the time. Roman Catholics seeking political power to obtain government funding for their schools were at a loss how to build a coalition with evangelical Protestants until a federal court ruled in the mid-1970s that the IRS could deprive a fundamentalist Christian university of tax-exempt status on account of its racially discriminatory policies. The 1975 ruling in the Bob Jones University case 
alarmed evangelicals who now knew that the feds were coming after their segregated Christian schools. The result was the establishment of Jerry Falwell's Moral Majority and Pat Robertson's Christian Coalition. They knew they could not use racial segregation as an organizing issue. So they joined with Catholics in using the issue of abortion to motivate evangelicals to political involvement. And obviously that was a very effective decision. Now Seventh-day Adventist leaders were alarmed by these developments, seeing in them obvious parallels with our understanding of last day events. They would quote Ellen White in The Great Controversy, through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. And this is a quote that, that longtime Adventists uh, know very well. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism, they will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power, and under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. Well, Protestants had indeed stretched their hands across the gulf and united with Catholics in opposing abortion and seeking funding for Christian schools. And Adventist religious liberty leaders understood that the Catholic view of abortion was premised on the heresy of the immortality of the soul, one of the twin errors that would lead to the, pers uh, to the persecution and deception of the last days. Adventist leaders were right on target, but the final rapid movements of prophecy would take a little longer to unfold. So here we are, some 40 years after the founding of the Moral Majority, after Protestants united with Catholics in seeking political power. So where are we today? Ellen White said that when the church begins to seek for the power, uh, for, for secular power, it is evidence that she's lost the grace of Christ. Well, the American church today, the religious right, has obtained the political power that it sought. It's placed people in key positions at the seat of power of the most powerful empire in human history, more powerful than the empires of the ancient world. But in obtaining political power, in obtaining the exousia, the authority to rule, the American church has forsaken the power of Christ, the power of grace, the power of love. Now please understand, this is not a sermon about politics or political parties or politicians. My concern, my focus, is on the integrity of the gospel, the integrity of our witness, and for the true revelation of the character of Jesus Christ. Next slide, please. Now, to the onlooking secular world, and I work very closely with, with many lawyers and colleagues who are secular, the American church has become a bastion of bigotry, a white supremacist enclave of haters with a long laundry list of, of people to hate, Muslims, immigrants, liberals, Black Lives Matter folks, Jews, and of course, gays. Now the world does not see our Jesus, Jesus friend of sinners, Jesus, for whom red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. Jesus, who is unwilling that any should perish, but wants all to come to repentance. Friends, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. The reputation and the witness of the church in our country has been destroyed by the politics of the white evangelical church. It's a very serious problem that won't go away just because we raise the volume and sing Blessed Assurance a little louder. You see, there are two Jesuses. There's the Jesus who laid down his life to save you and me, the Jesus of grace, 
And then there's the Jesus of the church that has abandoned the grace of God in pursuit of power. Next slide, please. Ellen White understood the mindset of those who worship a Jesus of power. It is nothing new. From Desire of Ages, she wrote, Today in the religious world, there are multitudes who, as they believe, are working for the establishment of the kingdom of Christ as an earthly and temporal dominion. They desire to make our Lord the ruler of the kingdoms of this world, the ruler in its courts, military camps, its legislative halls, its palaces and marketplaces. They expect him to rule through legal enactments enforced by human authority. Since Christ is not now here in person, they themselves will undertake to act in his stead, to execute the laws of his kingdom. The establishment of such a kingdom is what the Jews desired in the days of Christ. They would have received Jesus had he been willing to establish a temporal dominion to enforce what they regarded as the laws of God and to make them the expositors of his will, the agents of his authority. But he said, my kingdom is not of this world. He would not accept the earthly throne. The Jesus of power says, my kingdom is of this world. And Ellen White here describes what has come to be known as dominionism. If you want to understand this movement better, uh, do a little research on the topic of, of dominionism. This Jesus of power has a law, but it's neither the great or the second commandment. It's not the law that says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. It is a law of morality, closer to the view of the Puritans who settled in Massachusetts. It is a my way or the highway sort of law that extends no grace. It will be enforced in the end with the death penalty. And right here is where I believe Seventh-day Adventists are at risk of deception. We have a religion that greatly loves and respects God's law, don't we? But Mark of the Beast religion is also a religion of law, albeit a counterfeit. But truth and error lie close together. So close that Jesus warns the elect that they are not immune from deception. Now make no mistake, Mark of the Beast religion is premised on Christian morality, biblical morality even, tempting Adventists to be all in. We can easily become swept up in the enthusiasm of politics and the moral self-righteousness of law and omit the weightier matters of the law. As Jesus said, justice and mercy and faithfulness. So there are two Jesuses. The Jesus of grace and the Jesus of power. And each Jesus has a law. The law of love or the law of morality. Today the American church has obtained the exousia the power to rule and has the intent to rule in Christ's name. But at what cost? Its witness to the unchurched has been destroyed. The emphasis on legislating morality and its means justify the ends politics is offensive and repels many, including our youth, who are fleeing organized religion in record numbers. But the promise remains for us the promise of the dunamis power of the Spirit, by which we are called to witness to Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth, even to Santa Clarita, right? Amen. Next slide. The power of the Holy Spirit is manifest. Next slide, please. Manifest is the Spirit of grace. Jesus describes those filled with the Spirit in the parable of the judgment in Matthew 25. Those who stand in the judgment are those who give a cup of cold water to the thirsty, they feed the hungry, they clothe the naked, they give shelter to the stranger. That's what grace does, 
right? But in so doing, they do it to Jesus. Now, Jesus doesn't say that the sheep were separated from the goats on the basis of Bible doctrine or what kind of worship music you sing. If you want to be God's sheep and not the devil's goats, you need the spirit of grace. The spirit that sees Jesus even in the least of these, my brethren, and loves not just the Jesus that looks like you and fits in with your church, but even those who don't fit, those who are the least. Surely, our witness has to be that they will know we are Christians by our love. Amen? We're left with a choice. The devil offers us the kingdoms of this world. We can join with those who seek political power, the exousia, and we can rule in God's name and have all the moral laws we want. Or we can have the gift of God, the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit, which brings to us the grace of Jesus Christ. But we can't have both. We can be sheep, or we can be goats. If we strive to be first in power, we shall be last. Jesus told his disciples it was not for them to know the times or the seasons which the Father reserved to his own authority. They were not to know when Messiah, the son of David, would come and rule all nations with a rod of iron. But we're left with the promise that Jesus himself will one day come and set things right we will get to see the Jesus of power, the true Jesus of power, one day. Last slide. But until then, if we seek power in Jesus' name, we deny Christ, who taught us that if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Amen.